When the blessed martyr began to enumerate the well-known crimes attributed to the gods of paganism, there arose at first a long murmur among the spectators, which soon burst forth into loud exclamations. Some cried out that he should forthwith be put to the torture. Other, admiring his courage and fortitude, insisted that he should be heard. The prefect, who did not abandon the hope of causing him to apostatize, said to the martyr, If thou hast aught else to say, let us hear it. Yes, replied Victor, I have fairly portrayed the character of your gods, and shown to you why they deserve rather the contempt and exhortation of rational men than their veneration. How different is the God whom we adore! How worthy of our love and adoration is he who, when we were his enemies, loved us first, yea, with an eternal love. To save us from the stares and deceits of wicked demons, he became man, not losing aught of his divinity, but clothing himself with our human nature and dwelled amongst us. Oh, how rich was that poverty which you blame in him, when, at his words, ships were filled with fish, when, with five loaves, he fed five thousand men. How strong was his weakness, which he healed all our infirmities. How life-giving was his mortal nature, which commanded the dead to arise from the tomb. Do you, perhaps, doubt the truth of these miracles? All these things have been foretold from the beginning, and according to his promises are performed by his followers even in our own day, as yourselves can attest. Oh, would that your eyes were opened, that you might behold the greatness of him whom all nature obeys. And then, what was there ever more holy than his life, more pure than his doctrine, more beneficial than his promises, more dreadful than his threats, more secure than his protection, more lovely than his friendship, more ravishing than his glory, who among your gods is like unto him. All the gods of the Gentiles are devils. Therefore, they and their worshippers shall be condemned to everlasting fire. But our God hath made the heavens. Therefore, blessed are they that fear the Lord, that walk in his ways. Wherefore, most noble and learned men, use the keenness of your intellect. Lay aside for a moment all hatred and contention. Examine the questions fairly, and weigh impartially the reasons advanced by both parties. Degrade no longer the image of the divinity which is in you. Forsake the unclean demons who are hurrying you into endless ruin. Acknowledge your maker, your benefactor, so holy, so beautiful, so just, so merciful, whose loneliness will raise you up, whose poverty will enrich you, whose death will restore you to life, whose saving warnings now call upon you, whose rewards invite you, that he may receive you into his everlasting glory and gladden you with his friendship forever. When the martyr ceased speaking, the prefect stood abashed and was unable to make a reply. He saw that the arguments adduced by the veteran warrior in favor of the truth were unanswerable, yet he was unwilling, or too timid, to make a frank avowal of his real sentiments. The other officers who presided with him at his trial were not less confused. Soon, however, they began to consult among themselves to know what course they should pursue, as might have been expected from persons whose minds were set upon the things of this world, they concluded to gain by force what they could not obtain by false and deceitful reasonings. The prefect then said to him, Victor, wilt thou never stop philosophizing? Victor replied, I cannot but speak the things which I know to be for your own good and for the advantage of all them that hear me, answered the martyr. Make thy choice of two things, either to appease the gods by offering sacrifice or to perish miserably. If that be the alternative which you propose, said Victor, I must needs confirm by my example what I have taught by my words. I despise your gods. I confess Jesus Christ. Now heap upon me whatever torments you may choose. I am ready to endure them all for my faith. This fearless answer of the martyr so exasperated the prefect and the officers that there arose a dispute among them, each one claiming the privilege of wrecking vengeance on the enemy of the gods. 
Etucus, who had hitherto conducted the trial, at last resigned his right in favor of Astrius, his brother officer. This man no sooner had the martyr in his power than he ordered him to be stretched upon the rack. His sufferings were long and intense. Victor, raising his eyes to heaven, whence alone he could expect consolation, prayed aloud. Lord Jesus, grant me patience, grant me strength. His hopes were not disappointed. He beheld the heavens opened, his blessed Redeemer, holding in one hand the cross, the emblem of victory through sufferings, appeared to him. He looked down upon the generous sufferer and with a smile of encouragement said, Peace be with thee, Victor. I am Jesus, who suffer in my saints whatsoever insults and torments they endure. Be of good cheer. I support thee in the struggle. I am waiting to crown thee after thou hast conquered. At these words of the Savior, all the bodily pains of the martyr suddenly vanished. His countenance became calm, his eye shone with the brightness of ecstatic joy. In his heart he sang a hymn of thankfulness to the God who deigned to visit and comfort his servant. Meanwhile the executioners, although they continually relieved one another, grew weary with tormenting the unconquerable soldier of Christ. Seeing that all their efforts proved useless, and that, on the contrary, the martyr seemed to derive new strength from his very sufferings, they began to expostulate with the prefect. Astrius ordered them to loosen the prisoner and to cast him into the darkest dungeon of the city. Nor was he satisfied that by so doing he had secured the noble athlete, for he could not but perceive that there was something supernatural in the whole conduct of Victor. Wherefore, to prevent every untoward accident, he gave orders that a guard of three soldiers should be placed near the door of the prison. But the Savior, who, on the last day, shall say to them that art at the left, I was sick and in prison, and ye did not visit me, did not forget the noble champion who had so boldly confessed his name before men. About the middle of the night, when the deepest silence reigned all around, the door of the dungeon is suddenly thrown open. A light far brighter than that of the sun illumines the martyr's cell. Struck with amazement at the sight, the three soldiers fall prostrate on the ground. They hear the sounds of heavenly melody. They distinguish words of praise and thanksgiving to God, the Creator and Redeemer. So soon as the singing ceases and the marvelous vision disappears, the soldiers arise and, with one consent, enter the dungeon, throw themselves at the feet of the martyr, and beg his pardon for the harsh treatment he has received at their hands. Victor shows to them that, were they to know the happiness of suffering for Christ, they would not pity, but rather envy him. And yet, said he, that which doubtless you have just now witnessed is but a foreshadowing of the never-ending bliss which awaits the Christian after his life. The Lord Jesus hath sent down his angels to comfort and strengthen his unworthy servant. Noble warrior, they said, have pity on us. Teach us how we may become partakers of the happiness is in the next world. What must we do to be saved? Believe in God and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, whom he has sent into the world for the salvation of men. Repent of your sins and be baptized. We believe, they exclaimed, that the God of the Christians is the only true God, the Creator and Lord of the universe. We ask for baptism. Baptism.